True crime is a billion dollar industry, profiting from something as family friendly as Cluedo to the gruesome reenactment documentaries. So many of us are fascinated by some of history's most horrific moments. But when the presentation is showing off the application of a flawless smoky eye, as well as a person's last moments, is there a chance we all got so caught up in the story that we forgot the point? Hello gorgeous, how are you? Welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel if you haven't seen one of my videos before. Here's your warning, today's video is gonna be dense, like a fucking cheesecake. Just in case YouTube did that really fun thing where it didn't send people the notification that I posted this video, I posted this video and in it I mentioned that there is a conversation happening around true crime and makeup and if the combo genre is ethical and I was naive, I should have seen it coming, but I didn't see it coming because my comment section had a lot of people discussing it. Oh, you mentioned people discuss it. It's, it's what the comment section is there for, JJ. Like, it just... Like, I may not be the brightest cookie in the tool shed, but hot diggity damn, I have enough brain cells for that. So I decided I brought up the conversation. I should do a whole entire video outlining all of it. But before we get into it, a teeny bit of housekeeping. Disclaimer and content warning in this video, as I've already specified, we are going to be discussing true crime and makeup video. I'm not going to be talking about any direct details from homicide or disappearance cases, except for a YouTube video that had footage of the van that Gabby Petito was last seen in abandoned on the side of the road, as well as discussions and use of photo and video footage of Netflix series, specifically Making a Murderer and Don't Fuck With Cats. But we will be discussing broadly homicide and disappearance cases and the trauma related to them. Full transparency in the research and production of this video, I have developed a bias, but I will be making that incredibly clear throughout this video. And of course, as always, even though I trust every single one of you, I still need to explicitly state that I do not promote, encourage, or endorse any kind of mean, negative, harassing, malicious behavior. My videos are strictly for entertainment purposes only, and I do not want for any kind of mean, hateful, harassing, malicious, behavior to go out there into the world because of something that I've said or on my behalf. We are of course allowed to keep it cheeky, we're allowed to keep it messy, and we're allowed to keep it fun, but please keep it to this comment section and this video only. With all of that said, let's get on with the video. The origins of true crime can be traced back for hundreds of years, but as technology has evolved, so too has this genre or entertainment. And with the increasing popularity and accessibility of social media, podcasts, and other online streaming services, the genre has become more profitable than ever. Netflix documentary series Making a Murderer follows the story of Stephen Avery that resulted in an online petition to free Stephen receiving over 530,000 signatures. The documentary series winning 11 awards and gaining 19.3 million views in the first 35 days of its release. In 2015, it is reported that Netflix had 70.84 million subscribers. So 27.95% of Netflix's subscribers watched the documentary series in 35 days, which is an absolutely incredible engagement rate for anyone. And since then, the amount of these documentary and documentary series have only increased, exploring the twisted mind and actions of some of the world's cruelest. So it isn't surprising to see that some creators have managed to grow a significant platform divulging all of the gory details to other fans of the true crime genre. What surprises some is that combo genres like true crime and makeup have become bafflingly popular over the last few years and therefore profitable. It is a very simple concept. A creator and therefore narrator for the case sits in front of the camera, discusses and divulges all of the info on the case that they can find as they apply their makeup. There isn't any instructions as to how to blend all of your shadows together or or how to properly contour your face. It is just simply the creator applying makeup as an extra layer of visuals. So it isn't too far a leap to assume that the video itself would still have the same qualitative value even if the creator wasn't applying their makeup. So why is it that this extra cherry on top is so engaging, so necessary, and have so much discourse? Dr. Sharon Packer, a private psychiatrist and assistant clinic professor, explains in an interview article that the intrigue in true crime could be schadenfreude. 
simply deriving pleasure from another person's suffering. Not in a way where it's sadistic, but in a way where you are relieved that you aren't the party that was hit with this suffering. She goes on to explain that there may also be some sense of relief that you weren't the person who committed the murder, that at one point in time, most of us have jokingly said, I could kill that person. So there's a relief that you didn't follow through on that joke. And also highlights that there is possibly this sense of control watching these true crime cases unfold because you are learning from them how to protect yourself and your loved ones. But also that with these true crime cases, we also get to experience the legal side of the case where we get to hear or see justice or at times, unfortunately, injustice be served. But with the CSI effect and people's expectations of how a courtroom works and how a legal system works being heavily influenced by the media, these proceedings may have the tendency to make prosecutors and defense attorneys fall short of what the public sees as justice. Other research highlights the entertainment value in the mystery of these cases, in the whodunit of these cases. Trying to piece together all of the information you are being given on the case and following the case until you get to the arrest is in itself engaging. And when you mix together all of these reasons we are captivated by true crime, it is primarily women who are engaged the most. A study conducted by a University of Illinois professor and their student found that women were more likely to read about true crime versus true stories about war or gang violence, even if the victims are all female. According to this study, research suspects that even though men are statistically shown to be more likely to commit these violent crimes and be the victims of these violent crimes, women are more likely to fear becoming victims of these crimes. This fear of an attack could perhaps drive a person's interest to read true crime as there is a desire to not become a victim as an act of self-preservation. But regardless of what the true reason is behind why true crime is just so fascinating, the primary demographic is women, the same primary demographic as makeup. And even though I'm personally of the opinion that makeup is for all, makeup is for everyone, if you wanna wear makeup, do it. Do whatever makes you happy. The marketing is still primarily aimed at women because women are the primary consumers. So even though the pairing of true crime and makeup may seem like a specific flavor of odd from a business standpoint in which I have no formal education, it does make sense why these two genres have overlapped over the last few years. Take two or more things where the primary demographic is women and mix them together. Take two or more things where the primary demographic is men and mix them together. Oh, people love Biscoff cookies and Nutella? Genius. So it does start to make sense how creators have hundreds of thousands to millions of subscribers and gain hundreds of thousands to millions of views per video, sitting in front of their camera, applying their makeup and discussing some of the most twisted people to ever walk this earth, especially with a classic makeup true crime thumbnail. A makeup artist in the middle, pulling some sort of face with a colorful Gaussian blurred outline, some pictures of sometimes the victims of these crimes, but mainly the murderers in the background and some bold writing over the top, giving some brief detail or intrigue to the case. And a title that at times has some similarities to our 2014 YouTube clickbait titles to really catch a stranger's eye and draw in a familiar face. Granted, these titles and thumbnails are nothing new when it comes to YouTube. They are used by so many different niches and genres online. But when the focal point of the video is someone's last traumatic moments, the ethical divide does become gaping because death is, for lack of a better phrasing, quite sacred in most, if not all, cultures. And when these last moments are as traumatic as the ones highlighted in these true crime videos, both makeup and non-makeup, an essence of respect is looked for, is hoped for, because heartbreakingly, these victims are no longer here to consent to their story being shared. And I guess that's why I found something quite consistent in the true crime makeup niche, as well as other niches in the true crime genre, being that there is so much focus on the murderer, who they were, where they were, what made them tick, how they knew their victims, how they chose their victims, what they did after, what did they do to get caught or what they possibly did to get away. All of this information on the murderer rather than the victim. And I guess that's because they are the ones that can still speak. If they are willing to, these murderers can give as many details as they want in true, emphasized, or false statements to the press or anyone willing to share their story, which is how so much information can be collected, but it puts the focus on their point of view in this situation. Whereas any victim's details and their story can only be told by loved ones if they are willing to speak or the person that ended their life. So unfortunately, there is an inability to share the victim's perspective and therefore put more focus on 
upon them to paint the audience a picture. But there is also this morbid curiosity to figure out what makes a murderer tick, what drives a person to commit such a heinous crime. I am guessing because we are all searching for that sense of relief that we are not like these murderers as Dr. Packer highlighted. So this respect, this compassion that we are all hoping to see in these videos can only extend so far because unfortunately, there still needs to be a story. Because whether we are willing to admit it or not as true crime fans or watchers, the way that the cases are presented to us is as a story. It's a true story, but it's a story nonetheless. And as I've said plenty of times on this channel, the art of storytelling can be dangerous in the wrong hands. Which is probably why there are quite significant differences between traditional media's true crime productions and social medias. Even though the genre is called true crime, the most popular stories to produce and consume are are homicides and disappearances because they can make the best stories. With so much mystery, suspense, and shock value with just how gruesome and puzzling these cases can be, and as I highlighted before, the look into the mind of a killer and the analysis of what could possibly drive a person to take another's life, there is probably less than a handful of reasons for ending someone's life that a person could empathize with, which is possibly why we seek answers and why we can be caught off guard by a killer's actions. Whereas with crimes like robbery, physical assault, vandalism, drug possession, a lot of us can empathize with a person's reasons when it comes to committing these acts. Can see ways where they themselves can be led to those charges, which unfortunately takes away some of the suspense, some of the shock, some of the mystery from the story, which makes it less gripping and engaging for the audience. There is of course still a variety of documentary and documentary series out there in traditional media's true crime genre that don't approach homicide or disappearances but for the most part, from what I've found, those two are by far the most common. With social media's true crime community, I would say that this ratio is more unbalanced. You would struggle for quite some time to find a case that wasn't homicide or disappearance by simply typing into the search bar true crime. A reason as to why we see this unbalance more so in social media is because time and time again, we see that the most shocking is engaged with more. The more obscene, the more intrigue, the more a thumbnail pops, the more a title boggles, the mind, the more likely you are to get that click. For our YouTube creators, there's really no rules or regulations around the content from title and thumbnail to production, unless the creator wants the video to be fully monetized. Whereas with traditional media, there is quite a hefty amount of rules and regulations that must be followed in order to produce true crime content that won't at minimum destroy part of someone's reputation or career. Copyright is oddly quite a significant hurdle that traditional media has to navigate in order to accurately portray the visuals of the crime. If photos or videos are not a part of the public domain and as a Forbes article states has a modicum of creativity, meaning that the photo or media could be classified as copyright protected. Something as simple as a mugshot is copyrightable by the police agency that takes it. Just because something is used as evidence in the trial doesn't mean that the evidence is now in the public domain. Consent is also a big one. Are you wanting to use private communication between the convicted and someone else? Well, you need to have consent from both parties. Otherwise a claim can be made against the production even by the convicted. Are you wanting to interview family, friends, witnesses, law enforcement, or anyone else possibly involved in the case? Well, you need consent. Are you wanting to get B-roll of any parties out and about? You may also need consent depending on where the B-roll is taken because private property is a big no-no. Are there any non-publication orders? Are you reporting on a case that still has legal proceedings or is set to have legal proceedings. Because reporting on a case that may affect legal proceedings has a risk of contempt, not to mention your classic cases of defamation. This isn't to undermine the efforts of our true crime content creators, but when it comes to constructing their content, they already have these complex legalities sorted for them by traditional media. Because yes, I am assuming, but from what I've seen, these content creators aren't collecting information the same way a journalist is. They aren't conducting interviews. They aren't waiting outside of courthouses for statements, photos, and videos. They aren't calling up police agencies for mugshots, body dash cam footage, or interrogation footage because the work is already done for them with the help of Google. I'm guessing that all of the video and photo footage being used in YouTube true crime is being collected through traditional media or from public social media pages of the people involved in the cases that they've been led to via traditional media, which isn't a bad thing. It's an efficient system. It just means that there's less laws, rules, and regulations that our creators have to be wary of, and really less of an expectation
expectation for them to handle themselves a specific way when presenting a case. If you want to be employed and you want to further your career in traditional media, how you approach and handle a case is incredibly important. One misstep and that could be your reputation tarnished. This misstep could be as simple as an off joke, but could be as complex as a claim against your piece. Whereas with our social media creators, if their personalities shine through in their videos, eventually they can make dark humor jokes. They can even giggle because the audience understands that this could be a coping mechanism. They can be as emotional as they want or need. They can be as shocked as they want to be because it's their channel and their audience love these little aspects of their personalities that pop out throughout the video. What I'm trying to outline is that traditional media has this kind of industry standard when it comes to producing true crime content. It doesn't mean that everything that is produced is ethical and it doesn't mean that someone can't produce something that is damaging, but it just means that there is consequences that a producer will face if these standards are not met. But this standard doesn't exist on social media. There is of course people's subjective opinion, but there are so many out there that can't be quantified into a universal standard for YouTube and really all of social media, which is where we really start to see this conversation split. Because there isn't this defined standard when it comes to true crime content on YouTube and on social media, we've been seeing these combo genres becoming increasingly popular. There isn't just true crime and makeup, there's also true crime and ASMR, there's also true crime and mukbang. With how many views, subscribers, and how much money these videos would be generating, I'm sure that we are going to be seeing more fresh new combo genres, as well as fresh faces popping up in the true crime community this year. Which for some I'm sure is a very exciting idea because there is going to be more content that they love for them to enjoy. But for others, this is an increasingly uncomfortable thought because these creators are profiting off of something traumatic. They are making an income off of retelling someone's last moments and the horrors that they would have experienced. And at times, what was done to their body after they had already died. But doing so in a way where the attention of the video isn't solely focused on the story itself. And instead there is an extra layer of entertainment added to the video, which is how we come to two sides of this coin because this conversation can really be boiled down to a simple binary question. Is true crime and makeup on YouTube ethical? There's quite a few arguments for both sides of this conversation, but one concept that I've seen all over YouTube, Reddit, articles and comment sections is that this video format makes these cases more palatable. The combination of makeup and true crime allows for the more gruesome, gut-wrenching details to feel a bit lesser to the viewer. My guess is because you as an audience member are able to focus on the makeup that is being applied rather than solely on the details of the case. Which I definitely understand this theory because I cannot do horror movies. I understand that there are some fantastic ones out there, but it is a strong hell no from me. So one way that I found that I can watch these horror movies is through CinemaSins or pretty much its commentary videos because there is a layer of comedy, a layer of jokes that I myself as a scaredy cat can hide behind. With the fact that these true crime stories are real, there is less to hide behind because they are our reality's possibility. So having this extra layer of entertainment from our creator could be quite a comfort to someone who is a little bit more sensitive to the graphic details. However, where this point starts to fall apart is that this palatability is a privilege that we as audience members and bystanders are given. We can have these stories censored because they're not our true stories. These cases can be presented to us by our narrators in a way that it is digestible, in a way where it is engaging, in a way where at times it is entertaining. For our benefit, but also theirs, because the more engagement, the more views, and therefore the more capital. But the victims and the loved ones of the victims don't have this privilege. This privilege was stolen from them in the most traumatic way when their loved one's life and future was stolen from them. And it isn't just the event itself that traumatizes these victims and their loved ones, it's also the investigations and the trials. And the longer that these drag on for, the longer it takes for the healing process to start. Because it has been stated by thousands at this point that these investigations and trials reopen wounds that haven't even had a chance to heal. So how palatable, how digestible this content is, is only for the benefit of the audience, is only for the benefit of the creator, and for some this justification is enough. 
but for some it just isn't. Another popular point brought up to defend our makeup true crime beauties is that these videos bring mass attention to needed cases and to the injustices in the justice system overall, but also for specific cases. Which of course goes without saying is incredibly important because victims and their loved ones deserve justice and deserve for their voices to be heard. With some of these videos gaining millions of views, hundreds of thousands of likes and tens of thousands of comments, a specific case could reach the right people for justice to truly be served and for these victims and their loved ones to have their voices heard. Cold cases have been known to reopen due to attention specific pieces of media have gained, leading to more closure for the cases and for loved ones. Which is why I understand why true crime content creator Kendall Ray is given so much praise. Because Kendall has forms to fill out in the descriptions of her videos and one of the forms is specifically for the friends, family and loved ones of a specific victim to have their case covered. So that this case can be heard and so that justice and closure can be reached. With each of these videos, links to petitions, donations and information can be found in the description so that some sort of audience interaction can be made and perhaps something could be done. It may not seem like much but every little bit helps and I understand that Kendall is still profiting off of these videos and is still profiting off of these stories and true crime content but it is just really nice to see that someone is actively trying to give back to the community. With our true crime makeup beauties, I wasn't expecting anyone to format their videos, format their channel exactly like Kendall does, but I did go through a minimum of 20 of the most recent uploads from a few of our true crime makeup content creators and found that in titles, thumbnails, videos, comment sections and descriptions, the only links were for sponsorships, sponsorship information or affiliate codes for any of the makeup used or any of the technology used to produce the video. I understand that their channel is a business and a smart way to make part of your living online is through passive income, so affiliate codes and sponsorships are of course fine. And with makeup videos, some subscribers want to know how to get the look, so being able to find and purchase the exact same products is really helpful to have in the description. But if the argument for is that these videos are bringing mass attention to these cases, are seeking justice for these cases, and are giving a voice to the victims and their loved ones, then where are the links? Where are the links to petitions? Where are the links to specific charities? Where are the links to information on this specific case or just information in general so that those hundreds of thousands to millions of viewers can help so that they can do something. The attention to the case starts and finishes when the video starts and finishes if no external path is given. Which may be the reason why even though the attention that a specific case has gotten in the media both traditional and social has reopened the cold case it's still an incredibly rare occurrence when you look at the ratio of re open cold cases thanks to media traditional and social versus the amount of true crime content out there. One argument for that I found, which I felt was quite odd, was that it isn't just true crime and makeup, that these issues would be seen in any kind of combo genre when it came to the true crime community, but also that it would be found in the true crime community as a whole. Capitalizing off someone's trauma and someone's last moments, sensationalizing details, glorifying the killers, and just in general being disrespectful when presenting the case are all issues that can be found in any kind of genre when it comes to true crime on YouTube, because an individual disrespectful creator doesn't make an entire niche disrespectful, a bad apple kind of situation. Which yes, that is a fair point. I've made a whole entire series on this channel outlining the history of the beauty community's tears, dramas, scandals, and controversies originally to try and prove that the whole entire beauty community isn't toxic, it is just a few bad apples. The reason that I find this point of it isn't just true crime and makeup odd is because doesn't that just highlight that there is a bigger issue with the genre as a whole? A bigger issue issue that we need to address and therefore because true crime and makeup falls under the true crime genre there is inherently a problem with it and if that is the case then we as creators we as consumers should fix that. Develop an ethical standard when it comes to true crime content on YouTube, but at the same time when you start to do that, subjective opinion starts flooding in from everywhere and it can get really messy really fast. The main argument against makeup and true crime is simply capitalizing off of people's death this way is immoral. With some of our top makeup and true crime creators gaining hundreds of thousands of views minimum and quite a few times a few million views per video, there is already a pretty substantial profit, but on top of that sponsorships are also quite frequent in 
these videos, which of course love that for the creator, but it is also quite a significant profit for that video. But there is also affiliate codes that aren't always disclosed in the description, which generate more income for the creator, as well as links to merch stores as well. So there is by the looks of it on average, three to four ways a true crime makeup creator profits from their content, which of course love that for them. But this profit of potentially thousands of dollars per upload is because of a detailed story of how someone was horrifically and heartbreakingly murdered, leaving loved ones behind to grieve and relive the trauma throughout the investigation and trial, if the case even gets to a trial, is told to the creator's audience with some of the creator's focus directed at perfecting their current makeup look. And to put it insultingly simple, if you don't want to watch the content, then don't. So much of social media is subjective opinion. We may agree on some things. We may disagree on some things. We may agree for different reasons. We may disagree for others. And so much of this can be influenced by personal bias, because if you don't like a specific creator, you probably aren't going to like their content. And it is no one's job in this world to directly please you. It isn't a social media creator's job to directly please you. If they don't want to do something, then they won't. If they do want to do something, then they will. It isn't a necessary part of the job to pander to you. There is a lot of truth in the idea that you can't please everyone because you just can't. But there is also quite a few people out there in the world that I'm guessing that all of us don't really care if we're not pleasing. There's probably some homophobes, racists and sexists out there whose nerves I really get on. Good. A creator's job is simply to make entertaining and engaging content that they want to make. And if you don't like the content or you find the content insulting, the unfortunate truth is that you aren't being forced to watch it. They have a job the same as everyone else. There are of course more arguments for and against true crime and makeup content out there, but these are the ones that I found were most common. And I see and understand both sides. It doesn't mean that I agree or disagree with some points. It just means that I see see and understand where they come from. I don't want anyone thinking that what I'm trying to say is grab your pitchforks, grab your flaming torches, we've got some cancelling to do. Because over the years, unsurprisingly, my thoughts on cancel culture and cancellation have definitely evolved. And for this specific conversation, I just don't think it would be constructive. But also it's just two entirely different conversations. Cancel culture and cancellation is incredibly different to, hey, there is this system and it has flaws and these flaws could possibly be fixed. So from beginning to end of this video, my goal is not to cancel anyone, is not to send an angry mob after anyone. It is just to have a conversation about something that I highlighted in a previous video. Looking into this conversation and the true crime makeup genre as much as I have recently, I can see how a person would be engaged with this content. I can see how someone would find a level of entertainment in this content. And I can see how a creator of this content would be incredibly proud of their efforts. I don't think that these creators who produce this kind of content are bad people, are toxic people. I can understand how a person could reach this point where they produce this kind of content. If I was as into true crime as some of these creators, I probably would have fallen into exactly the same niche because I understand that when something makes you so satisfied and happy, it's really hard to remove your own feelings and desires from others' pain that you might be indirectly causing. Watching the content previous and more recently to research for this video, I did find that I was uncomfortable with titling thumbnail and the videos as a whole at times. For me personally, majority of the time, the focus seemed to be on the murderers rather than the victims. And as I said before, that's probably because the point of view of a victim is incredibly hard to almost impossible at times to prove. And also the mind of a killer is so detached from what most of us can empathize with. So the mystery, the suspense, the tension can can be built up by following the killers before, during and after the murders. But capitalizing off the traumatic murder of a person and retelling their story with the primary focus being on their murderer, explaining the details of their death through the point of view of someone else already feels quite uncomfortable to me. But adding the makeup get ready with me element over the top takes even more focus away from the victims and their loved ones, especially when you look at the comment sections. And I would say this about any kind of combo genre that follows this specific format, it could be PC builds, it could be sculpting, it could be cooking, it could be building Legos. The reason why I'm highlighting true crime and makeup is because the makeup community is where I'm most invested, but also it's the conversation that I brought up in my last video. There are of course a lot of comments on these videos commenting on the specific case that is being outlined in that specific video, 
but there are also a lot of comments praising the creator for their makeup skills, praising the look that they have created in the video, asking what products are being used, asking what products they would recommend, complimenting the creator on their narration skills, and really just complimenting the creator in general. And unsurprisingly, the more I watched, the more I saw that people were coming back to these videos because they like the creator. They love the creator, which of course is perfectly fine and makes a lot of sense that people would enjoy the person presenting them this content, but it didn't seem to matter what case was being presented as long as it was that specific creator that was presenting the case. It just feels at times very desensitized, very removed from the true weight of the situation, from the true value of the victims and their loved ones' voices, justice, closure, their story in general. I don't think that that is anyone's intention because I don't think that these creators or consumers are bad people, but I think that this combination has evolved to this state and should perhaps work towards a more holistic ethical development. Where the aim of the content isn't to solely benefit these creators and their audience, but also benefit these victims and their loved ones because they don't get the privilege of this content being censored and digestible. Because it is hard for me to consider personally why any possible re-traumatizing these loved ones may face is for the benefit of complete strangers on the internet for the sake of entertainment and money that at times is disguised as justice. One thing that had me incredibly curious as I highlighted earlier in the video is that I'm aware why it is always homicide and disappearance cases getting covered because they are the most shocking, but it was still weird to me that for something that is called true crime, so all crime, it's only these homicide and disappearance cases getting covered. Researching for this video, I did find that I swayed more towards liking the financial crimes or just the stupid crimes. And at times I was scratching my head wondering why no one's covering these because even though I know it still seemed odd because there are plenty of weird, fascinating true crime stories out there where no one loses their life. You've got the inventor of the Ponzi scheme, Charles Ponzi, who swindled from investors around $20 million in the 1920s. You have Bernard Madoff, who was sentenced to 150 years in prison for history's largest Ponzi scheme that defrauded up to 65 billion dollars, including fictional profits. Old mate Victor Lustig conned his way into selling the Eiffel Tower off as scrap metal not once, but allegedly twice. One of my absolute favorites, in Germany in 2017, a truck filled with Nutella and Kinder Eggs was robbed of 70,000 euros worth of Nutella and Kinder Eggs. The police had to put out a statement saying, anyone offered large quantities of chocolate via unconventional channels should report it to the police immediately. <laughs> And it doesn't stop there for 2017, because in 2017, there was also the Great Beehive Heist, where someone was suspected of stealing an estimated $1 million worth of bees. In 2016, cheese pirates, you heard it right, cheese pirates in Wisconsin stole 20,000 pounds worth of cheese, which was estimated to be about $46,000 worth of cheese. In Australia in 2015, a guy messed up our post offices for quite some time by stealing $300,000 worth of stamps and another one of my absolute favorites, the Great Canadian Maple Syrup Heist, where over the space of a few months between 2011 and 2012, $18.7 million worth of maple syrup was stolen from a facility in Quebec. There are so many other true crime cases out there that involve something as uniquely genius as maple syrup that these true crime channels can be covering, but instead are only focusing on homicides and disappearances. Which, if that's what fascinates you, that's perfectly fine. I'm not your boss, I can't tell you what to make, and I can't tell you what to consume, but I just wanted to give some solutions as well as both sides of this conversation. because. Maybe I haven't put enough thought into this, so my apologies, but I feel as though there would be a lot more moral room to be making these dark humor jokes whilst discussing the Wisconsin cheese heist or putting on makeup and discussing the Eiffel Tower being sold off as scrap metal, not once, but twice. <laughs> or profiting off of a video discussing the downfall of Charles Ponzi because I think someone should be profiting off of him that isn't defrauding people. Because when we start to get to the core of this issue being the profits that these creators make from these makeup true crime videos, the 
conversation does get quite complex because we can't dictate how a person should use their platform or how a person should spend their money because it's theirs and they as a person have autonomy. There's also no evidence to suggest that these creators aren't donating money to charities who help people who are affected by such traumas that they cover in their videos, but there also isn't any evidence to suggest that they are unless they specify or show receipts of their donations. There's also no evidence to suggest that these creators are or aren't signing petitions that help people who are affected by the tragedies that they cover in their videos. And with how charity has been exploited by creators for views, subscribers and profit over the years online, specifically on YouTube, there is a sour taste left in many mouths to the point where if a creator does specify that they are donating to charity, then this act of charity is tainted by an aspect of selfishness because it works in their career's favor to be charitable and generous. A charitable, generous act for the sake of content has ulterior motives. So I wouldn't be surprised to see comments slamming these channels for expressing their donations to charities or for promoting these charities and petitions. I think the benefits far outweigh any hypothetical negative comments, but it does come down to each individual creator and what they want to do with their platform. And also this isn't specific to the makeup true crime niche. I do think that some of these true crime creators could do more to give back to the community that gives them their platform. But I also think that a certain standard should be developed when it comes to social media's true crime content. Because watching TikTok's For You page during the disappearance of Gabby Petito and the eventual discovery of her body, even though some people were genuinely trying to keep the public informed, there were still a few sour apples who were clout chasing and capitalizing on her disappearance and death. With investigators actually finding important witness information via a video that was uploaded to YouTube, I don't want anyone to go and harass the people who uploaded the video because because from what I can tell, some of the intent of posting the video was to encourage people in the area who may have seen something that didn't know they'd seen something to come forward. Which of course is fabulous, but some of this intention must have been lost in translation. Because according to a Buzzfeed News article, Northport Police Information Officer Taylor stated the video footage wasn't handed into the police by the channel hosts. They found out about the video via calls into the station mentioning the video. I'm not saying that these creators specifically specifically are sour apples or that they directly intended to capitalize off of Gabby Petito's disappearance and death. It's just unfortunately one of the outcomes because personally, I think they could have done more by simply calling the police. I think it's fantastic that the internet makes it so easy for a missing person's details to get out to the public so easily and therefore have more legitimate information and leads than was possible 20 years ago. But I think that there should be the development of an ethical standard so that the main focus can't can't be to profit off of someone's trauma. Because it is heartbreaking to see that many loved ones of those who have been murdered have their nightmares come to life when Netflix decides to do a series covering the story of their loved one's death in a way that sensationalizes the story or sympathizes with the murderer or glorifies the murderer. So when these true crime makeup videos that primarily cover homicides and disappearances reach millions of people regularly, it isn't too far a leap to assume that maybe these videos have the same effect. Personally, if any of the people I loved were murdered and I saw that their story was being featured in a YouTube true crime video before reaching out to me first, I would be livid. And if I saw that that video had a sponsorship as well, I would be livid. If I saw throughout the video or in the description of the video, no links to petitions or charities to help the specific case or just to help people who have been affected by these traumas, I would be livid. And if I saw in the description of the video, a list of makeup products used and an affiliate code for every single one of them generating more money for the creator, I would be beyond livid. I can't speak for the loved ones of these victims because I don't have this personal experience, but I can only imagine what these loved ones feel if and when these videos reach them. But I know myself well enough to know the level of anger and heartbreak I would be experiencing if I were to be in that situation. I know it's as simple as if you don't like the content, then don't watch it. And that is true. And that's why I haven't consumed this kind of content for quite some time outside of researching for this video. I also know that it's as simple as if you don't agree with the content, then don't make it, which is why I don't 
don't make the content. But I also know and understand that there is a level of hypocrisy when it comes to my content and how I format it. Because I have covered quite a few heavy topics in my commentary videos. And for most of them, I sit down and do my makeup as I present you all of the info and my personal opinions. And looking back at it, perhaps I shouldn't have. I know what my explanations were for jumping into this style of content, but Regardless of what that is, after researching this conversation, I think I do need to take a step back and understand if my previous content is disrespectful because of the makeup commentary combo and move forward from there. Because with most of my content, I have covered the worst moments of a specific creator's careers and the worst moments of the beauty community, which at times is bafflingly heavy. Some of these situations have victims and those victims have suffered trauma. And if the one distinct difference between my content and makeup true crime content is that the victims in what I discuss are alive, then I don't want the standard to be that we should only respect and empathize with someone's life and trauma when they've died. That's just not okay. I also know that I could do more to give back and that is something that I've been working on, but in my personal opinion, it's not happening fast enough. So that is something that I am going to be actively working towards a little harder. Ultimately, there is a conversation happening about the ethics of true crime and makeup content mixing, whether making the content more digestible, engaging and entertaining with the addition of a makeup get ready with me is disrespectful and damaging considering the profitability and popularity of the videos. From an outsider's perspective, to see the classic thumbnail of a makeup artist posing with a bold outline surrounded by bloody photos of a murderer and possibly their victims with a clickbait-esque title, it is easy to see how it can be perceived as a disgusting portrayal of a person's last moments and trauma for financial gain. Watching these videos, it is easy to see how these hosts are quite charming, are quite endearing, because they are talking directly to you through the camera as if you were just besties doing your makeup together. And to me personally, it is clear that a lot of the intention of posting this kind of content is to bring awareness to these cases. But as I've said so many times on this channel, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And as I've said so many times in this video, this palatability is a privilege. When researching for this video, I was informed of a documentary miniseries, Don't Fuck With Cats. This miniseries followed the initial internet investigations of a series of three cat murdering videos conducted by a dedicated Facebook group that turned into an international manhunt for the filmed murder of Justin Lin. The murderer was caught and charged and is now serving a 25 year life sentence without the possibility of parole, as well as an extra 19 years without the possibility of parole for other crimes committed within the same timeline. The family of Justin Lin gave the court a victim impact statement written by his father. In it, he states, I live each day with regret that all I now see available will never be his that his name will only be associated with a horrible, degrading crime. It causes me fresh pain to know that my son's legacy is to be remembered as a victim. He not only suffered in his murder, but will be humiliated for each time his name is mentioned, and it hurts me deeply and will hurt me forever. Justin is described as brave, smart, caring, adventurous, handsome, and strong by his father in the impact statement. And from the interviews with friends used for the documentary miniseries, he was a person who anyone would be incredibly lucky to be able to call their friend. The miniseries Don't Fuck With Cats for me specifically was quite heavy to watch and the last five minutes of it did have me in a state of well damn because one of the Facebook group's leaders for lack of a better phrasing Deanna Thompson was interviewed asking were we complicit in Luca's crimes. She highlighted this guilt that she fights with and questioned if the initial investigation into the initial YouTube videos actually fed the desires of this monster. And the series finished on her addressing the audience of the series, asking us, the people watching a whole documentary on this monster, are we complicit? I don't think for any of the questions I've given you in this video have strictly binary answers because there's just too much subjective opinion and just too much gray area. I don't think for any of the individual conversations or the overall debate I've presented to you can be boiled down to a simple yes or no answer because once again, there is too much subjective opinion and too much gray area. I can't tell you what to post as a creator and I can't tell you what to follow as a subscriber and I can't tell you how to feel about each individual piece 
piece of content because it's all subjective and it will be influenced by so many different factors. I also don't judge or at the very least actively work towards not judging within reason of course, but I think you'll know what side of the coin I lean more towards. What about you? How are we? How are we all doing? Because as I said at the beginning of the video, if I remember correctly, this video is dense like a fucking cheesecake. It's a heavy, complex, gray area conversation and I don't know what other adequate way to sum it up except for heavy, complex, gray area conversation or dense like a fucking cheesecake. Cause there's a lot of information, there's a lot of opinions and it's, it, it's a lot. I hope that this video does clear up quite a few queries that I had on my last video, but I also hope that this video does somehow way down the line contribute to really constructive change for this niche because I do see a lot of positives in it and I do understand where these positives come from. I just think that it's okay to have conversations about things having flaws and I think it's okay to have that conversation because how else can we work towards solutions? I just hope that I articulated the whole conversation adequately and I hope that I got across my thoughts and opinions in a way where they made sense. Also, I wanted to take a cheeky second to apologize for my lack of posting over last month specifically, but also over the last few months. Uh, long story short, share housing in Sydney, two housemates who are no longer housemates uh, chose disrespect and threatened to steal some of my money. It's been a long, exhausting, tiring situation over the last few months, but that chapter's done and I am really looking forward to moving forward and not having to have that extra weight on my chest, extra weight on my shoulders. But that's also why I had to take a break in the middle of filming this video because a lot just kind of exploded in the middle of me filming and also why I have a new background at the moment that will be temporary. So thank you so much for all of your love, support and all of your patience over the last few months, years, however long you've been subscribed to me because I'm so grateful and I'm so appreciative. But please let me know all of your thoughts and opinions in the comment section, especially for this video because reading your comments, I read every single one of them, is one of the best ways that I can learn because hi, I'm JJ. If you don't know me, I love learning. And yeah, one of the best ways I can learn is reading your perspectives, seeing your perspectives and just soaking it up like a sponge. Please also let me know if I missed anything in this video and also let me know what you want me to talk about next because I know what I want me to talk about, but I don't know what you want me to talk about unless you tell me. And of course, thank you so much for watching this video because my content, she is quite lengthy and quite dense. And this video will probably be around the 48 minute mark. And there's a lot of other things you could be doing in 48 minutes. So the fact that you chose to donate it to me, thank you so much. And I just hope that you are having a fantastic day, fantastic week, fantastic month, fantastic year. And I hope that you are doing as fantastic as always. Bye everyone.